Today marks the start of our HVAC system. Our house will actually feature two air handling systems, a Mr. Cool DIY multi-zone ductless system to condition the downstairs garage and utility areas, which is the focus of this video. We will also install a Mr. Cool universal ducted system for the upstairs living space, but that is a topic for another video. Mr. Cool graciously sent us their products to install and bring you along each step of the way. The front garage bays will get an 18,000 BTU wall unit and the back side will get a 12,000 BTU unit. These ductless systems are super efficient at 22 sear, where a regular air conditioner will typically be around 14 sear. Our outdoor condenser can actually handle a third indoor unit, even though we only need two for this space. The start of any good project is a good foundation, and we need to have a slab here for our two outdoor units. They're pretty heavy. I think together they're probably over 500 pounds, and they need to be secured onto a solid base, which for me, I'm going to do with a concrete slab. I used our chief architect software to plan not only the size of the pad, but the orientation of the units and how the line sets are going to come off in order to give us the correct length without too much excess or too little. This software was a huge help in making this install look really professional. We had two small pads that I cast with leftover concrete from our main pour and the software also allowed me to lay the units out to see that I didn't really want to use either of them. So I figured out the best dimensions for a new pad and it was off to the races pouring it. We have a whole video on this if you're curious on the details. Thankfully, it turned out much better than our main slab. That turned out pretty good. Yeah. Here's our imaginary rebar marks. Now, if I plan this out right, the mounting feet for both of these units, which are just slightly different, will clear these pencil lines when the unit is centered on the slab, front to back. Unveiling. Oh. oh, this one's not nearly as heavy. Okay, so it hurts me a little bit. Yeah. They say every good installation starts with a good plan, so let's go over the plan real quick for these ductless systems. Our garage essentially has two halves, this front bay where all the cars will sit, and then there's a big door opening behind me that leads to sort of a back bay or auxiliary wood shop area. So we decided to use two ductless mini split heads, a larger 18K unit, that's 18,000 BTU here in the front, and a 12K unit in the back. You might be wondering why we're conditioning this space to begin with, and there's kind of like three reasons. First and foremost, all of our living space is directly overhead, so we wanted to keep this fairly temperate so we're not wasting a ton of energy with a cool space up there and a hot space down here. Second, we're gonna be using this space quite a bit, me for woodworking and working on cars, and we're both gonna be exercising, and so we wanted to be able to condition it in the summer. And last, the reason we're actually using a ductless system rather than sharing the ducted system upstairs is we don't want any air transferring between down here and up there because we are gonna be having cars and sawdust and all sorts of stuff in here that we don't really want to be sharing air with the upstairs living space. Let's talk about the line sets real quick. This is what makes Mr. Cool units stand out a little bit and why they're truly a DIY friendly installation. The line sets already have refrigerant pre-charged in them. Traditionally, HVAC install requires these special vacuum pumps and gauges and uh, a pro to come out to charge the system to the right refrigerant levels. Well, that's all kind of done already. The, the units are pre-charged and the line sets are pre-charged. So really all you gotta do is mount the units, route these line sets, and then you can just turn it on. So that is the beauty of these and it's what makes us feel comfortable in tackling this as DIYers. One, two, three. It's very nicely packaged. Step one, I wanna drill the hole through this wall so that we can truly get a good idea of how long this line set's gotta be. Now, I thought a lot about how we're gonna do this wall penetration. Mr. Cool provides this nice little sleeve here, but when it comes to these little ductless unit line sets, there's a lot of room and I'm trying to build an airtight house, so I, I wanted to get something a little bit more snug. I found after measuring, I couldn't find this online or anything, but the, the diameters of these two line sets fit almost perfectly inside of a two inch regular PVC pipe. So I'm going to make a real sleeve 
out of two inch PVC. And then on the outside is sort of a rain flashing. I'm just gonna put a 22 and a half elbow. I'll seal it on the inside and on the outside. And I'm gonna have a nice sleeve that I can always replace the line set, you know, 25 years down the road if I ever need to. So I really wanted to get this condenser sitting here before we drill the hole. And this is why. I can actually see where the three line set outlets are on this unit. And that will tell me almost exactly where I need to drill my hole for a nice clean run. So I basically am sort of mocking up. These things come up at an angle and I'm only gonna be using two out of the three. We have two heads, but this condenser can actually support three. And uh, I'm basically gonna be drilling like here and here. So for my two line sets, I transfer that measurement on the inside and we're gonna drill our holes. Oops. Hi. This is the talking hole. I love you. Love you. We should probably just keep this open so birds can come in and, and hang out. Yeah, good idea. This is the beauty of zip liquid flash. From the outside, you can easily seal over these odd penetrations. We're gonna have a rain screen mat here and then a couple inches of stone veneer. So the stone will end uh, somewhere about here. And then of course I got my 22 and a half elbow. I'm just gonna snake up and glue on there. That is gonna be looking good. Now that we have our hole drilled, we are gonna run this 35 foot line set sort of roughly to see where our indoor air handler is going to end up. The instructions specifically tell you how to unroll this thing. You cannot just take one end and yank it and try to straighten it out. It needs to be unrolled like you're rolling a tire. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. Okay, so this doesn't have to go through a whole lot, but we can sort of inspect outside how far we need. Have you ever seen extremely large zip ties like this? Hello. <laughs> this is crazy. Moving some stuff out of the way so that we can start wrapping this up the wall and mock mocking exactly where it's gonna go. So this is what we're gonna use to fasten it to the wall. We're just gonna wrap it around like this and then screw on this side and screw on this side. Yep, the benefit of having plywood utility walls, you can just mount wherever you need to. Upgraded to the scaffold so that it's more ergonomic for Alex to reach up there. All right. We're off. We're off, Alex going for a ride through the door. Before we run the line sets to the 12K unit here above the bathroom door, I'm gonna soffit the ceiling down a foot so we have a place to run our line sets. So we're gonna go from a nine foot to an eight foot ceiling. Hardly ever gonna notice, I don't think, in the bathroom. But first, let me pre-insulate this wall. The benefit of being the framer, the insulator, the HVAC installer, and everything else in this project is you kind of get to think about all the different trades uh, while you're doing them so you don't box yourself into a corner. So before I soft the ceiling down and put a two by four across there for a ledger, I wanted to put some insulation in to make my life easier, both in the band joist up there and down here in the wall. As you can see, I'm using Rockwell R23 Comfort Bat. You can carve this stuff like a turkey and it basically uses the same knife too. Let me show you what I mean. So the first couple pieces I put up in here, I just cut to the correct square size and shoved in there, but I really think I can do better than that. I didn't like how it was kind of crushed and it left the gap on the outsides there. On the next one, I experimented with cutting the corners out because you can do it so well and that fits a lot better now. Laser coming in handy again. Love this tool. Once I had ledgers on all four walls and two by four ceiling joists installed, I unrolled my line set and fed them through my wall penetrations. I decided not to use the included three inch wall sleeve and instead use two two inch PVC pipes. I thought these would be easier to seal and I thought it was a little bit of a cleaner look, especially when I'm gonna have stone veneer that's pretty thick on the outside. These DIY pre-charged line sets are fixed length, so I did some careful measuring both in CAD and in person to make sure I didn't have too much or too little. You can coil up the excess, but I wasn't a fan of how it looked. So just keep that in mind if you're planning one of these installs. We got these two pieces of drywall up. These are gonna be the backing for our mini splits. I wanted to put this up first so that when we go to actually drywall, we don't have to either take the mini splits down, which we really can't do because they're connected to refrigerant lines, or have to like drywall right up next to the machine. We found a broken piece of drywall at Home Depot for half off, so like seven bucks. We were able to get just enough out of that to do these two little mini split backers. And we threw a coat of primer on there as well. So we should just be able to mask them off when it comes time to paint. Now let's get our brackets up. They provide this pretty handy cardboard template that helps in the initial marking. I think it's easier to see this than the bracket because the bracket's only this big, but it shows you actually where the unit sits. So we've got this one centered over this door here. We need six inches to the ceiling, six inches clearance. So this is the highest it could sit. I think we're gonna sit it about an inch lower than that. 
I'm just gonna put a, a hole right here, which I can easily reference on my actual bracket. Then with the actual bracket, I know exactly where it's gotta go. Should have blocking here and here if I measured correctly, and I can just put four screws, one in each corner. I almost forgot, another big benefit of this template is for the hole, the big hole for the line set. Doesn't have to be like dead tight, just tight. Just... Okay, we got our MC cable that's gotta go through the hole first, our drain pipe, and then our refrigerant pipes, which we're supposed to very carefully bend outwards, starting with your hand at the base. Sort of gotta predict where we're gonna have to meet the other line sets, which is right up. In bending these copper line sets, I wanted to make sure that they didn't get kinked here at the base, so I just cut the insulation back a little bit. I'll, I'll retape it back up, but it actually did make a pretty sharp bend without kinking because they are very smart and put these bending springs on, which prevents the copper from becoming kinked. So I'm just gonna very carefully bend these up, and when I bend copper, I try to, you know, like do it a little bit there, a little bit here, a little bit here, not all at one place, and it should turn out all right. Well, that was fun, but we got it hung up. Really sleek looking unit, I love it. Looking from the back here, we realized pretty quickly that the three and a half inch hole wasn't gonna cut it for everything that needed to come through. This, this electrical wire was pinching, and so was the drain hose here. So I just got my multi-tool and expanded that hole a bit for what we needed it. And then I curled my line sets up here, up into my soffited ceiling. That'll actually work out really well here with my line sets here, just gotta connect those guys up, tape this all with insulation, and we're gonna be good. Now for the drain hose, I bought a condensate pump for this guy, but I might be able to get away with gravity draining with some creativity here. If I go through these studs, go around this corner, boom, 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 boom. There's my floor drain right there. So I, if I just get, get out to this wall here, I can come straight down into that floor drain. I'm gonna give that a try, and hopefully I don't regret it. The 18K unit in the front garage was the exact same process. However, I did make a pretty big mistake with this unit and we will get to what exactly that was a little bit later. Now that we're hung up, we gotta connect our line sets here. So I'll start on the indoors. These have a very specific torque. They're supposed to be torqued too, but of course I'm borrowing some crow's feet and a digital torque wrench from a friend. And I told him just barely the wrong size for this guy right here. The manual actually says one inch will work on this. Well. Unfortunately, it's more like an inch and a sixteenth. It's basically 26 millimeters. So I told him to get the one inch. It's per the manual. I should have come out and measured it. But that's just a minor hiccup. I think I'm going to just use crescent wrenches to tighten this big guy. And then I do have the right size crow's foot for this guy, the small line here, that's a 15 sixteenths. And the manual was right about that one. I had about 18 inches of extra line to kind of use up for this run here. So that's why this is sort of coming down at a U shape and, and connecting back up to this guy. I think that'll work all right. The key is just making sure that these line set connectors aren't stressed when they're in their final resting place. Removing these caps here. You're only supposed to do it right before you actually connect so that there's no dirt introduced. I'm gonna snug this up with the crescents. You can hear the gases melting together. I'll put about 20 foot pounds on her. This is quite a bit for something this small, but. Okay, we hit it. That was 242 inch pounds, which is 20 foot pounds. Same deal for the big guy. I'm gonna check these all for gas leaks too, especially the ones that I can't torque all the way right now. Up in the soffited ceiling of our half bath, we've just done the same thing. Torquing those guys up there, and now I'm going to dab some of our magic bubbles here. Our big blue, it is a leak checker, leak detectant, and it's like super bubbles, really. So I'm just gonna dab it all over our connections here, see if we're forming any bubbles, and it'll tell me if any of this gas is leaking. Bubbles are applied. I don't see anything crazy yet, but I know once we actually start running, that is when the tendency to leak will really show itself. Now that my indoor units are mounted, time to anchor these outdoor units down to the concrete pad. I got my rotary hammer here and I'll be using blue Tapcon 516 screws 
three inches in. I'm gonna go ahead and do both units at the same time here. I lined these up symmetrically on the pad, made sure all my clearances were as good as they can be, and then I outlined my feet and marked my holes here. I'll just slightly shift them out of the way so I can drill the holes and then put them back where they're supposed to be and put the screws in. After I drilled and cleaned the holes, it didn't take long to run into a little bit of trouble when trying to fasten the unit down to the pad. I didn't think I was gonna have to take off all the shrouds for anchoring this thing, but unfortunately there's just not enough clearance right above the screw head for me to get a tool wet while the guard is on. So I've removed this whole front bit here. This unit was really designed, I think, for the uh, hammer-in expansion anchors that just leave up these little bolt stubs that you can set and set the unit on and put a nut on. But those are less common in the hot dip galvanized format than you'd imagine. I didn't see any of them at the big box stores. I would have had to order them special. So I just picked up some tap cons. And uh, of course, that's, I guess, not what these are really meant to be anchored with. So I'm having to get a little bit creative on my access here. On the back side, I think there's just enough room. Ah, even with my adapter, I'm right up against that housing right there. In fact, I scuffed it a little bit, which is kind of a shame trying to get that in there, but this is the very back bottom of the unit, so should never see it again. While I got it apart, might as well show what it looks like. Here's the inside of the DIY unit. It's got a pretty mean looking fan. Here's a little defroster coil in the bottom. Overall, it looks like a really nicely made unit. Lots of copper tubing for the heat exchangers and the compressor and everything else looks fairly well packaged as well in here. All right, let's put this thing back together. Huh, that was a lot easier than I thought it would be. The next step was condensate drainage. Both of these units, when in cooling mode, are going to pull humidity out of the air on the cold coils and it needs a place to go. So I went about securing the drainage tubes in a downward slope all the way to my condensate drain. Then while I was at it, I kind of tidied up and fastened the MC cables in next to the refrigerant lines to make everything look nice and neat. My goal for any trade related project is to do at least a good of a job as a professional and if not an even better job because I'm taking more time than most would. So I'm done tidying up all of the drain hoses and the electric cables. It looks much better now. I'm pretty happy with how this is turning out. Put this piece of plywood in here to support the drain hoses. Little pro tip on that, these hand jacks here, uh, I bought these for the window and door installs and they turn out to be really handy for a lot of other things too, like holding this plywood just like an inch or two off the ground. Uh, they're really kind of a cool thing, so I'll link it in the description. I definitely want to test both of my drain hoses. This one's going down at about a half inch per foot. This one is about the same. It comes through the wall here, and I think this is gonna work. I'm gonna test it with some water shortly here into the drain pans. I'm hoping I can keep it this way and not use the condensate pump. That would save us 240 bucks in two pumps, and I think it would be better just to not have another moving piece that could go wrong as well. Just let gravity do its thing. Now you know the saying, hindsight is 2020. Well, I'm looking at these drain pipes here and I'm just thinking they look nice, but the corrugations and the flexibleness of these drain hoses doesn't give me like warm fuzzies when it's gonna be buried behind drywall. If there was ever to be a sag that developed or a leak or something uh, that went wrong, I really don't wanna have to tear out drywall to try to address it with these flexible pipes. So what I think I'm gonna do is replace most of it with just three quarter inch PVC, which is what I'm using for the rest of my condensate system. I think it'll be a little bit more robust in the long term, and it will prevent the water from getting stuck in those corrugations. I know that in condensate lines, water tends to flow really slowly and it can easily build up algae and mold and that sort of thing, and that's why they get clogged. So I'm gonna try to avoid that uh, ahead of time by putting PVC lines in. A Little bit more work now, but I think it'll be worth it. So as I always say, do the work, undo the work, then redo the work. And that's exactly what we're doing here. I'm gonna take these flex lines out, replace them with solid lines. I think it'll just be a lot better of a solution long-term. I took the filter out of this one mini split and just poured some water down there to check the drain action to see what happened. And it is working. You can see if you look closely, there is water in here. And this is kind of what I was afraid of because it sags a little bit. Actually, it's actually worse here. This, this whole pipe right here is full of water. If I go like this, see it all run out. So I definitely want to replace that with solid pipe. It is working. I mean, you can definitely see it all draining. It's coming out, but 
Yeah, it definitely is not ideal. It's I would think if you're going straight outside of an, an outdoor wall, this is totally fine. But for my situation, uh, the PVC will do a lot better. Here's a trick for enlarging in an already existing hole with a hole saw. Just cut yourself a little guide. That way the, the hole saw can be piloted from the outside rather than the inside center bit. Easy as that. Fortunately, Supply House has these barb adapters that will go right onto my PVC fitting. Now, of course, this corrugated tubing doesn't just conveniently fit over this barb hose fitting. The, the hose fitting is made for the other end of the pipe, which has kind of a little bit of a bell on it. But I need that right up here, and this is where my length is. So I have to get a little bit creative here. I'm going to use my needle nose pliers to sort of expand this gently to fit over my barbed fitting and then probably wrap it in some electrical tape or something. I think I'll put some blue pipe tape on both to act as a lubricant and a sealant. I don't think this is gonna hurt anything. Condensate draining, I mean, it's just gravity pressure basically, so I'm not incredibly worried about it leaking. And just like that, the drain work is all redone in PVC. I really like how this turned out a lot better than using that corrugated hose. I tested it out by pouring like a cup of water in each one of the mini split drain pans and watched it trickle out at the, at the floor drain. So it seems to be working great. Well, I just realized I did something pretty stupid. On my larger unit in the, in the middle of the garage here, uh, we got a 35 foot line set for that unit. The default line set that comes attached to these ductless units are 25 foot. And when you buy the 35 foot line set, they supply you with a new 35 foot electrical cable. Guess who didn't put the electrical cable on the unit before we mounted it? So I'm literally all the way back here and I realized, crap, this thing is not gonna be long enough to reach that outdoor unit. I need about eight more feet. Now, in my defense, there's nothing in the instructions that mentions you need to change this cable out if you're changing line set lengths. I double checked. I called a ticket into their support line too to see if I could potentially change that MC cable without taking the unit off the wall. In the meantime, I fed the 35 cable outdoors where it's supposed to be. We'll at least get that connected, then run this all the way back to the unit it's supposed to go to, and then we'll figure out what to do from there. This is just another good example of if you're not thinking like 10 steps ahead, it's gonna bite you. This happens in construction, I found so often. You really don't hear about it because I don't think a lot of people are talking about it on social media or the likes, but this seriously, I feel like happens all the time. And I would say it even happens to professionals too. Time to commence operation change out MC cable because Alex forgot to do this before the unit was on the wall. So this guy's gotta come out and we have to replace with this guy that's already routed outside. So I've got my helper here, beautiful little helper. She's going to be helping me lift the unit off the wall and I'm gonna go as fast as I can trying to replace it. I don't even really remember how you're supposed to get this down. I think you're supposed to like lift, you're supposed to press up. I think you down and out. Down and out. Oh, yeah, there yeah, you go. I think that did it. There you go. Just takes a little woman. Almost hurt my fingy. Uh-oh. Yeah, I really would rather not unbend these refrigerant line sets because you can really only bend them so many times. I was under the impression that once connected, you couldn't disconnect the pre-charged line sets, but in fact, you actually can. Thank you to Mr. Cool Support Line for clearing that up. You can if you haven't opened any of the valves on the outdoor unit, which luckily I had not at this point. So once we realized we couldn't replace the cable with just taking it a few inches off the wall, I had to disconnect the refrigerant lines and we took it completely off. Okay. Hold, 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 hold. Well, we are changed out. That was only kind of a pain in the butt. Had to basically remove this plate and then get in the front and all the four terminal connections were in there, but we are switched out, thankfully, and we're ready to go back on the wall. Are you ready? I'm preparing myself mentally. Mentally preparing, let's do it. Luckily, reinstallation was much easier than uninstallation.
Once that situation was handled, it was time to conquer outdoor electrical. Hooking this up wasn't too bad. There's one, two, threes labeled for each of the A and the B unit. Ran into a bit of a struggle connecting these guys, the actual power wires coming from the box. The terminal blocks are really small. It's definitely meant for, say, 14 gauge wire, which is what these are right here. Now, a 10 gauge ring terminal, though, is quite a bit larger than that. So I found that the ring terminals don't even actually fit between the plastic dividers of this terminal block. And everything else in my handy set here doesn't even come close. These spade terminals aren't even meant for 10 gauge wire and they're still too wide. I think I'm gonna just basically have to clamp the wire in that terminal. I may be quickly educated by someone in the comments about what I'm doing wrong. Maybe I'm totally missing something. But aside from ordering some sort of custom thin spade terminal, I'm not really sure what else to do on this one. All right, that's what I ended up with. It's not too far off from how you terminate a circuit breaker, so I'm gonna go for it for now, but might need to change out later if I'm noticing any issues. Before I glued on the elbows, I used some low expansion foam to seal around the line sets and cables. I have these pipes flashed to the wall with liquid flash for both water and air sealing, and then I'm gluing on a 22 and a half elbow to direct water away from the opening. So for these AC systems, you gotta have an outside disconnect that's part of code. And so I'm gonna mount mine here. I just use one of these really cheap, they're like 20 bucks, the Versatech uh, mounting outlets. Looked inside my utility room and sort of measured and marked where these holes gotta be. So I'm starting to drill this one now. I still gotta get all the way through the wall. So I got my 18 inch drill bit here. I got about seven and a quarter. So standard drill bits just don't cut it. And then I gotta do one over there for my universal system. Make sure I'm going in somewhat level here. That's how you know your drill bit's sharp. Wow, that's awesome. This is a Harbor Freight drill bit, by the way. Look at that. Got our hole on the inside. Just gotta take a piece of 10-2 Romex and run that over to my main panel. A couple folks asked about mounting the Romex on the surface of this utility room wall during the Radiant install video, so I double checked with our inspector he confirmed that it's completely okay in our jurisdiction in the residential setting. It's not that much different than an unfinished basement. So I'm gonna stick with it. The NEC doesn't draw a firm line on surface mounting Romex, so this is always gonna vary by inspector and jurisdiction. I figured I'd at least try to air seal around these wires for what it's worth, since I did drill through my flashing here, but I will have another piece of flashing right here, so as far as water is concerned, it should be fine. But I figured why not throw some caulk on it while I'm here. To fasten this, I'm using these GRK two inch cabinet screws. They're the perfect length to go through my three quarter inch AZEC here and then into my zip OSB. Unfortunately, I'm not behind any studs where these boxes are at. So I just wanted to make sure I could grip in the OSB itself. But these do a nice job. They're coated T15 Torx head and it's sort of the flat head screw. So it does a good job at gripping a wide surface with fairly low pressure. No need to run it in crazy tight or anything. Oh my gosh, this blade is just dull as can be. This is not safe. It barely is a mark on this thing. Gotta mark this because it's not being used as a neutral wire. It's a hot wire, this is 10-2. So two conductors plus the ground, 10 gauge. Leave that in the off position, put our cover back on. Look at that. One thing I read was a good idea to install on these outdoor condenser units was one of these guys. This is a surge protector. Basically it protects your equipment in the event of big power surges like lightning or coming from the grid if someone like, you know, knocked down a power pole or something like that. And I was just about to install these things, but then I found that you can actually get whole home surge protectors that can go on your main panel and protect everything downstream, so including these condensers, but also all the rest of the stuff in the house that has a circuit board in it, which is basically everything these days. Pretty much all my utility room equipment's got a circuit board of some sort, and all the upstairs you know, appliances and anything we plug in typically is gonna have a circuit in it. So I'd like to do one of those whole home surge protectors, but I'm wondering if there's any benefit of adding this as well on these outdoor units. So if you're an HVAC professional or have ever dealt with this, is it worth putting this on these two or is, is it just unnecessary redundancy? Um, I couldn't really find a good answer online for that. So if you're an electrician or an HVAC guy, let me know.
To wrap up electrical, I shut off the main power, then tie it into my 30 amp GFCI double pole breakers. Before I begin opening my valves, I'll dab on my leak detector. That way I'll know pretty quickly if I got a leaking line. I just gotta open these caps and use my Allen key to rotate and open the valve inside of it. Whoa, that was weird. You can actually hear it filling the line with, I guess, refrigerant. I'm supposed to open this till it stops. Wasn't expecting to hear noise, so that was a little bit surprising. Then rinse and repeat for all these, these other three valves here, plus my two main valves up here. So I've got all the connections made out there. I've double checked all my refrigerant lines are tight. Double checked my wiring. I've even got batteries in my remotes. I think it's time to start this thing up. My disconnect is set to on outdoors. So this should be the magic switch to make things go on. I might have to turn it on with the remote, but let's see what happens. I heard a beep. Let's go check it out. All right, I'm gonna hit my remotes. Oh, look at that. Louver's coming down. So this is the remote for this one. There we go. Well, it's blowing, it's really quiet. Can barely hear these things. All right, I'm gonna crank it down to the lowest temperature it'll go, both of them. They're set at 75 right now. So I think they're actually not trying to cool at this point. We'll go down to 62, that's the lowest it'll go. Oh, now it's ramping up. Let me go check on our outdoor unit. Outdoor unit has not yet turned on. There might be some sort of delay where the air handlers need to run for a little bit. Oh, actually I hear it running now. Wow, that is quiet. Honestly, most of the noise is just from the fan. That's really, really quiet. Paying close attention for any bubbles, I'm probably gonna dab some more on as well. It's definitely blowing nice cool air. That is awesome. Something I never really noticed, I guess, in other air conditioners, but I'm pretty sure it's normal, is you can actually hear the sound of the refrigerant coming through the pipes. Listen to this closely. I guess typically you're only hearing this from the outside, just something I've never really noticed before. These have been running for a little while and they seem to be doing quite well, still blowing really nice cold air, no crazy sounds, no leaks that I can check. So let's crank it up to as hot as it'll go and see what happens. 86 is our max temperature and obviously we're gonna have to change our mode to heat. So it shut everything down. And I guess now they're gonna start coming back on. The whole refrigerant cycle's gotta reverse. Okay, outdoor unit has shut off. I bet there's a delay to let the coils either warm up or cool off, one or the other. I can't remember how that cycle works. So we'll just let it sit for a little while. Fast forward about three minutes and the units kick back on. They do appear to be blowing nice warm air. It's not like hot, even though it's set to 86, but it's probably good enough for what it's supposed to be doing. I mean, it feels good. Pretty amazing that this one machine can both heat and cool just by reversing its cycle and do it efficiently, much more efficiently than uh, I think pretty much any other way of heating or cooling. Everyone in the world that with air conditioning, including me, should be thanking a mechanical engineer right now because without them, it wouldn't be possible. And in heating mode, the outdoor unit is blowing nice cool air. It's like air conditioning out here. The ambient temperature day is probably in the low 70s, so it could actually go either way, heating or cooling fairly easily, I think, uh, but this feels pretty cool. It's mystical. Now that I've checked for all my leaks, the last thing I gotta do is just finish insulating and tidying up these line sets, kind of tying them together, racking, wrapping them all in kind of one piece so it looks a little bit more coherent. It's a little bit difficult to get that looking neat, but I think it turned out all right, especially for non-adhesive tape. I'm not sure how long this stuff's gonna last. I might have to invest in a heavier protective sleeve eventually, but I think it'll do the trick for now. One note on this is I spiraled it starting from the bottom up. That way any rainwater sheds off the spirals and doesn't tend to collect in this wrap. I'm gonna wipe this all clean here before I attempt to wrap my sound deadening pads. We're back to cool mode and these things are freezing cold. These are what they call the sound deadening pads, I guess to wrap these connections in. They do have a self-adhesive -adhe layer on it, sort of like a thick rubber membrane. That's what it feels like. It's like the consistency of taffy. Next step, insulation. I'm gonna try to like wrap this with some electrical tape just to kind of keep it all together. I almost forgot one step, which I didn't see anything in the manual about, but I did see it in their YouTube video and that is putting these little auxiliary air filters inside the air filter mesh. 
I didn't know what these were when I unpacked them, um, but they do fit perfectly in here, so it makes sense that this is what they're for. And there's no real direction on which way it goes, so I put the mesh side towards the concave side of the screen. But yeah, just didn't want to forget these either. I'm gonna call that a wrap on the DIY mini split install. That was really not too bad at all. I've never had any HVAC experience whatsoever and I was able to install that system with really not too much headache. Couple mistakes on my part, but overall I'm really looking forward to the system. I think it's a great solution to condition our garage space. We can't share air with the upstairs living space. So that is why we are going to be installing a universal ducted system as well. That is a topic for the next video. But I hope you learned something from this or got some entertainment otherwise out of watching my mistakes and we will see you on the next one.